Um, yeah, it's this piece is called uh, uh, Switch, just a dumb title like us. Uh, and it was um, I made it for a show in two thousand nine, like three years ago, and the show was called Switch and Bait, um, which is the sort of heavy-handed title of um, Switch. There was this, and then the, this. There was another room that had a credit card made of graphite. So it, it was like just as the uh, recession crested in um, in uh, beginning of 2009. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's a bunch of light fixtures. The, the, the light tubes are made of um, machined graphite, like the solid. Uh, they're just standard light fixtures, the uh, six foot light fixtures that we took the ballasts out of. Um, they cost about 40 bucks each. Um, and then there's a hidden rod that holds the, um, the graphite lights. And it, um, <coughs> at the moment, there's 36, there's six rows of six in this. But it could be the first time I showed it, it was um, 45 fixtures, and they were more arranged in. You walked in, and the lines went away from you. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how you would install it. As long as it looked natural, mm -hmm. is, is how I see it. Like it looks like you might install the lights in a real working place. The good thing about graphite is that it's um, really familiar and it's dirty and it's very precise. It, it's uh, it's made. It's used in the steel industry because it's the ideal material to to cut. Um, it's but it also, as we know from pencils, rubs off on you. So. You could, it's, it's, it's actually not really any different from that sculpture in the back room, which is a mirror, and it's called Shoegazer, mm -hmm. and it's, that's from like 2000, I actually had it made, that's from like 1998 or something, but I never made it till 2004. Um, and it it's, looks like a minimalist object, and it comes from the mirrors that uh, you, you used to see in shoe stores in Britain when I was a kid. Like, but, yeah, there's like an old bench or something in the, sh in the store with a sort of old leather top and you s in any shoe store. In, like when I was a kid in Scotland, and you sit down, there's like a tilted mirror on the side and you could, you could see the shoes. So this obviously refers to minimalism and, and Flavin and Walter de Maria and um, that sort of precision and, and the kind of optimism that seems to sit behind that kind of precision. Like we're going to make it perfect and it's going to look fantastic because the minimalist object will save your life. But it's like, yeah, but what if it won't? Right. Um, what if it actually, the factory is non-functioning? It's interesting that you use the terms optimism and minimalism in the same sentence because many people you know, relate to it in the, the <coughs> obverse in a way. They see minimalism as sort of foreclosing any opening of optimism and you know, almost like the Death Star into itself and you know um, yeah, optimistic for the minimalist artist exactly okay <laughs> <laughs> but also and you talked about this a lot you know sort of being the 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 flaneur you know walking the city that you're like really inspired by the street and you know there's obviously a very pop sensibility in terms of being obsessed with not just pop culture in terms of celebrity but, but current events and and politics yep. and it expresses itself in a number of ways that might see um, anomalous to one another, but actually I think that's what's nice about the selections in the exhibition, it begins to bring together a lot of these gestures. Right. Um, and I just, because we never ever discussed it, you really wrote obituaries? Yeah, I, I had a job from um, about 2000, no, 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 uh, from like uh, 94, five, for a few years, I left London in 2000. Uh, Part-time job, two or three days a week, writing and editing obituaries for the Daily Telegraph, which is like a, a, kind of a, a right-wing, not by American standards actually, but relatively right-wing um, newspaper in England, mostly designed at that time for sort of colonels in the in the counties, you know, old-fashioned, um, and they. I had this job, it was a good job for an artist, you could get it at 11 in the morning, paid quite well, pretty relaxed. Um, and I wrote 
um, whatever came in that day, we would edit. And then when it was quiet, you would, um, uh, in the summer, people don't die in the summer, people die in the winter. So in the summer, it's very quiet. In August, let's say, so like, who do you want to write about? We need stuff for the files. And, it, and <clears throat> so you start preparing obituaries yeah. who weren't dead yet? Yes, yeah. Any big paper has a ton of obituaries. And at that point, this is, they were literally in files and in paper, paper copy. It was like quite, and I would, so you would write these things from previous cuttings from previous newspapers. Um, and I would write, so they're like, who do you want to write about? So it's like, oh, I'll write Leo Castelli's obituary, who was still alive then. And they're like, who's Leo Castelli? And I'm like, he's great. You need, we should have this. So I wrote, so, Marcello Mastroianni, I wrote. Elias Canetti, I wrote before he died. So a few, I was like, I'm going to write about somebody I'm interested in. Um, by the end, like before I left London to go to New York, I was like, I don't want to be doing this job anymore. I don't want to turn, you know, I'm in my, by that point, mid-30s. And I'm like, this is really fucked up. Like, I don't want to be. Um, Sort of the only way, uh, well, it, it's, it is, people go, that's such a morbid job. I'm like, look, it's just a job, I, you know. Actually, it is weird to be writing. Um, there is no, it's not, it's, if you want to be a journalist, you don't get a job in, in, in the obituary desk. It's not going to take you anywhere. I didn't want to be a journalist, but I didn't even, I also didn't want to be doing that. So, coming to New York, and I, I did the Malcolm McLaren one in London, but coming to America and making a series of them was a big deal for me, because, personally, because it was like taking a problem and turning the problem into a solution. And in fact, the obituaries are about this idea that, apart from the idea that they're fictional, even though they're totally accurate, um, I find they're optimistic in the sense that they're about people making decisions through the narrative to try and make their lives better. I mean, that's the principle. Like, um, and so I'm going, I'm trying to make art, and I can't. And how do you do this every day? And, you know, or, or, and it's like you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. And so it's like I have this problem, and I change my life, and I turn the problem. It's like, oh, I'm going to make these into artworks, and they're going to say something to me about my relationship to work. Looking at the obituaries last night, and when they were created, all of the subjects are alive, and that was sort of the point yep. of these being your yep. art object. Yep. Malcolm McLaren's dead. Yeah. Is that piece no longer the piece that you created? Yeah. The piece is totally redundant and, and re now replaced. And um, forget it, you should chuck the piece out because you can go online and get the records and actually get Malcolm McLaren's real obituary and replace the artwork with that. Um, I, I thought it was great, to, interesting to make an artwork that definitely has a sell-by date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because because for, uh, whatever else is going to happen, this thing is definitely going to happen. I mean, it's not, and it isn't necessarily morbid, it's, but it is about the only reliable thing you could possibly say about Nicole Kidman, is that she's definitely going to die. And, and I, you know, I'm not, it's, 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 I don't know, is that morbid? It's like, it's, it's more about, there's not much else you can um, state with, with um, certainty. I thought it was funny that you could have these artworks that for sure are going to change at some point. Uh, and there, and Malcolm, somebody will die, they'll become redundant, and they'll get replaced by something that's going to be very similar to the thing I've given you. And I know it's going to be similar because I wrote them. And, and people go, yeah, but they're not really. And it's like, yeah, actually, this is exactly how they're written because I had a lot of really annoying, boring, long days <laughs> writing them. So, so it's like, yeah, yeah. But I definitely, that thing is what, yeah. And in this case, I, that's probably the first time I've installed those in a line for a while, and since then, Mark McLaren did die, mm -hmm. and so did Marilyn Chambers. So they're both like down a couple of inches ah. in that installation. Uh, and but I don't want Malcolm McLaren to have died at all. Right. Um, so 
not like it was a wish thing by creating the piece. No, sometimes people, people have said to me, uh, I said this the other day, like, uh, why don't you do so-and-so's, that asshole, you know? And I'm like, why would I bother making artwork about somebody I didn't like? 